Today, we are going to discuss about how war was fought, in ancient, and medieval India. In ancient time in India, troops were recruited, trained, and equipped by the state. There were also many communities, and forest tribes, or Atavika in Sankrit, that were known for their military skills, and prized as such. Such people lived by the profession of arms. The army was composed of four arms, infantry, cavalry, chariots, and elephants. They were all deployed in the field of battle in formation, as decided by the commanders, based on factors such as, the nature of the terrain, and the composition of one's, and one's enemy's forces. Great concern was shown to the training of men, and animals. The kings, and princes were well trained in the arts of war, and leadership, personally led armies, and participated in the defense of forts. Wooden battle chariots were used as command vehicles, and prized for their mobility as they could carry archers, who could shoot while moving throughout the battlefield. Yoked with two, or even four horses, these vehicles could easily mow down enemy infantry, but could be used only in the plain terrains. Thus around 6th century BCE, elephants replaced the chariots as the elite arm. They acted as command vehicles, and provided shock value, or psychological impact on the enemy. Their other functions included clearing the way for marches, fording rivers, guarding the army's front, flanks and rear, and battering down fort walls. The elephants were basically tanks in ancient India. The infantry was the largest in number, and it was only towards the end of the ancient period that cavalry came to occupy some position of importance, especially under the Rajput rulers in north, central, and western India, who used horses, and even camels. In South India, the climate was not suitable to the breeding of horses but of elephants, and hence the dynasties there focused on elephants, infantry, and the navy. The elephants were at the front, chariots at the flanks, and horses at the wings were believed to be the best formation to break the center of the enemy's army. Despite the battle formation, once the battle began, the fighting would become general. The infantry would bear the brunt of the fight, attacked mercilessly by chariots, elephants, and cavalry. The infantry did not fight in compact formations, like the famous Greek or Macedonian phalanx. The main aim was to rout the enemy troops, and kill the king or commander, as that would lead to his men fleeing, and thus decide the day. The chief commander could order the advance or retreat, and marshal the units by assigning trumpets, boards, banners, or flags. The cavalry was used for cutting off provisions, and reinforcements of the enemy, scouting, and reconnaissance, charging the enemy especially at the flanks, and the rear, protecting other units of the army, and covering advances, and retreats, and pursuing the retreating enemy. Weapons and Armor Arms included bows and arrows, swords, double-handed broadswords, oval, rectangular, or bell-shaped shields, which are often of animal hides, spears, javelins, lances, axes, pikes, clubs, and maces. Bows were the primary weapon for the infantry, chariot, and elephant warriors, and even the commanders. One type of bow was peculiar to the Indians, it was of equal length with the man who bore it, which he rested on the ground, and pressed one of its ends with the left foot before releasing the arrow. The cavalry carried two lances, and a buckler, or round shield, smaller than the infantry one. Soldiers were either generally bare to the waist, or wore quilted cotton jackets. Tunics were worn during winters. The lower garment was a loose cloth worn as a kilt, or in the drawer style, with one end tucked in at the back. The cavalrymen used trousers. The elites commanding the army, or other officials wore armor, especially of metal. Armor included helmets, turbans, covers for neck, torso, sleeved, or sleeveless coats of varied length, wrist guards, and gloves. There was also armor made from hides, hoofs, and horns of certain animals like tortoise, rhinoceros, bison, elephant, or metal chainmail. Command Structures The emperor, or king was always the supreme commander, followed by the crown prince, or yuvaraja, and the general, or commander-in-chief, or senapati. Below that were the superintendents of the various arms known as, Rathadhyaksha for chariots, 
Gadget Hayasha for elephants, Ashvat Hayaksha for cavalry, Hadiadaksha for infantry, and Navad Hayaksha, in case of the navy. In some kingdoms, however, the cavalry and elephants consisted of a single division. Units and ranks below that varied across kingdoms, and empires, and across different time periods. Fortifications, and siege warfare. Forts were required not only for the security of the populace that lived in its vicinity, but the kingdom as a whole. Capturing forts was necessary as most often, enemy capitals were usually fortified, and no invader could proclaim victory till he had captured these strategic strongholds. Forts were also treated as centers for administrative units. There were moats, ramparts, parapets, towers, turrets, and positions for archers, passages for flight, and exit doors along with multiple gates, secret landways, and waterways. The forts were also well stocked with the number and amount of resources necessary, for withstanding long sieges, such as food and weaponry. There were garrison troops specializing in defense of forts. Assaults were generally made by elephants. Archers played a huge role in both attack and defense. Naval Warfare The navy was used to transport troops to distant battlefields, participate in actual warfare, and was primarily meant for protecting the kingdom's trade on sea and navigable rivers, and the maritime trade routes by destroying pirates. The warships were used in battles which, as compared to land battles, remained low in proportion. The ancient Indians preferred to fight on land, and fights on sea were not given much importance, except in a few cases where destroying the enemy navy became crucial. Dynasties in the western, southern, and coastal eastern parts of India, situated on the sea coast, relied heavily on maritime trade, and the sea and built navies that were used in war. It was in these parts and the adjacent high seas that ancient India saw most of its naval warfare in practice. Naval warfare also was used in Assam, by the Aham army, in river Brahmaputra in their battle against the Mughal army. Also, wars with Sri Lankan kings made the southern Indian dynasties add to their navy. The Cholas conducted expeditions even to Southeast Asia. War by other means. Besides contesting on the battlefield, emphasis was laid on covert operations, on breaking the enemy's morale, sowing dissension among his ranks, causing rebellions, conspiracies, breaking of alliances and assassinations of kings or leaders. Such kinds of war were called as Gudayuda, or clandestine war, and Kudayuda, or concealed war. Assassins, spies and saboteurs thus played a huge role. Logistics The vast distances that characterized ancient India, made the movement of armies across vast tracts difficult. It was equally difficult to provide for armies going very long distances, hence, in most cases, logistics played a key role in determining the nature and duration of the campaigns, which would be generally towards areas geographically close to one's kingdom. In other rare cases, if the sovereign was intent on a distant campaign, efforts would be made to ensure provisions and a secure march. The armies were well provided for, and officials were appointed to look after the various needs of the army on the march, as well as in camp. The provisions, which included food, fodder, weapons, clothing, and camping materials, would be carried on bullock carts, elephants, mules, and camels. Often, such processes could be very chaotic. Technically, the cultivators, merchants, and villagers were to be left alone, but often in practice, the soldiers would plunder the grains, or merchandise, in which case complaints of the aggrieved could be put before the king, who was supposed to take action. Supply depots were maintained especially under the Mauryan emperors. A medical corps also existed composed of physicians, and surgeons with surgical instruments, and medicines. Problems with war and strategy in medieval India There are lots of successful invasion, by various foreign power throughout the history of India. The three main reasons, or problems of war strategies are mainly Failure to engage in protracted warfare One characteristic of Indian armies was their inability, or lack of desire to engage in protracted warfare, or guerrilla tactics. In India, local populations did not fight to the death, 
and warfare remained the province of military elites. If these were defeated, kingdoms would often fall into enemy hands. A part of the problem stemmed from the lack of centralized command, and unity of purpose in many Indian armies. If the main commanders were defeated, or killed, the component parts of the army often quickly fell apart, even if victory was still possible. This happened, for example, at the Battle of Tullicota in 1565, when the Vijayanagara Empire was defeated by a coalition of sultans. Although the city of Vijayanagar was not actually captured, and would have been difficult to do so, the various nobles of the empire simply fled back to their homes, and abandoned the capital. However, when armies did engage in protracted tactics, as the Marathas did against the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb for over two decades, there was success to be had. Another example of protracted tactics, used against the Mughal army, was the Aham Kingdom of Assam, and they eventually won against the Mughal army. No change in tactics. Although the ancient Indians had dealt with Scythian and Hunnic horse archers in 5th and 8th centuries CE, the lessons were not learnt, and when they were encountered again under the Turkic generals in 1192 CE. Before the defeat of Indian armies at Tarine in 1192, they had been battling Turkic militaries for several centuries, yet had failed to adapt their tactics accordingly. Turkic militaries used swift cavalry charges to defeat the largely infantry-based militaries of the subcontinent. Later on, in the 15th century, Indian armies, such as Vijayanagara, and the Delhi Sultanate were slow to adopt the use of gunpowder despite guns being introduced in large quantities by the Mughals and Portuguese. Additionally, for reasons beyond the comprehension of non-Indians, Indian armies continued to make heavy use of elephants. While elephants have some value in providing an initial shock, they are not very valuable in battle, as they lack the maneuverability and speed of horses, and are as likely to trample friendly soldiers just as easily as enemy soldiers, the elephants could even carry the commanders riding them away from the battlefield, which could be interpreted as flight, making their soldiers panic-stricken and flee, or they could simply give up the fight. Being at a height, the commander himself was a sitting duck, and could easily be targeted by enemy soldiers. In many cases, the royal elephant was expressly targeted for the same purpose. Additionally as Nader Shah, leader of the Persians, who defeated the Mughals in 1739 at Colonel pointed out. And I quote. What strange practice is this that the rulers of Hind have adopted? In the day of battle they ride on an elephant, and make themselves into a target for everybody. By the time of their disastrous defeat at the Battle of Karnal, against Persia in 1739, the Mughals had adopted many of the military characteristics of the subcontinent, including the use of large infantry armies, even while they maintained the swift cavalry, that won them India in the first place, in smaller numbers. This was partially a function of the heat of India, which weakens horses. A recurring theme of Indian military history, is the need for its states to import better horses from Central Asia, and Arabia. However, despite all these, the Mughals, and their successor states did not try to make the most of their infantries by equipping them, with European-style training and weapons. At the Battle of Plassey in 1757, the British army, largely composed of 2,100 trained Hindu peasants, and 1,100 British infantry defeated, 50,000 Mughal cavalry. No power projection. Indian armies largely remained overly defensive, and failed to project power to take out their enemies. They instead aimed to weather attacks from outside of the subcontinent, and hoped that their enemies would give up after failing to conquer India. The princes of the subcontinent faced constant invasion from the direction of Afghanistan, for hundreds of years before the conquest of North India, but never launched invasions attempting to subdue the Afghan cities of Ghazni, and Gore, where these attacks originated from. Rajput states did not make any attempt to conquer, and rule Delhi, despite being right next to it. The Sikhs defeated the Afghans in the 1830s, and the Marathas were victorious against the British, in the First Anglo-Maratha War in the 18th century. Even when Indian armies won battles, or successfully defended their territories, they often eventually lost wars in the long run, because of their failure to follow up on victories, 
constantly fighting defensive wars. India's coastal states, some of which had navies, did little to clear European navies out of local waters, perhaps because they did not understand the strategic importance of the ocean. The direction of conquest, and the spread of authority were always projected into the subcontinent T and rarely outside of it. Why was this? There are definitely logistical reasons behind this. It was very hard to move uphill, and supply a large infantry-based army moving out of the subcontinent. Mountain ranges make regular communication difficult. Additionally, there is little motivation for an army based in the fertile, and warm subcontinent, to conquer the barren mountains of Tibet, or Afghanistan. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed the video, please do consider to hit the like button. Also share the video, and do consider subscribing to the channel. Unfortunately, 99% of the people, who are watching my videos, aren't subscribed to the channel. I do sincerely hope, that you will change that, by subscribing to the channel.